Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth, and we receive it this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of are all sins already forgiven, past, present, and future? Or is it a lie? It is being taught widely in the body of Christ. It is something that we must understand. We see in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sounds like there's something that you and I are supposed to do. So, are all of our sins forgiven, past, present, and future, as many people are teaching today? You'll find, the as we look at the scriptures, we'll see the answer. The rationalization behind this is that, well, if Jesus, Jesus paid the price for sin, then how can we be judged by sin since it's already been paid for? Also, people think that, well, when we sin, because he's already paid the price, we don't need to ask forgiveness for it, but it's already been forgiven. That's the rationale. And if we sin, we don't have to feel guilty anymore because Jesus made us perfect forever, and so we don't have to do anything. And also, we see that They'll say that, well, all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, forgiven. That means that believers don't need to keep asking for forgiveness. They don't re need to repent at all to have their sins forgiven. That is the teaching that is going forth in many circles today, unfortunately, on TV and on radio. And it's something we must understand the truth so we can deal with this successfully in ministering to people. One particular man, he says there's two types of divine forgiveness. I never read that one in the Bible, but that's what he says. He says there is a judicial forgiveness. God grants it as being a judge that he's already judged all of our sins are washed away. Therefore, no penalty. We're eternally secure. No problems at all. We don't have to do anything. We're free. We're pardoned completely. And then the other type, he says, but that there's also a parental forgiveness, like a father to you. A parental forgiveness, where God's granting to you as your father, the father is correcting his children, but it doesn't affect your standing with God. He's just kind of correcting you, getting you on order. Two different types of forgiveness. I never read that in the Bible. Unfortunately, people have tried to make things up in order to fit their doctrinal stands, and we have quite a problem. There's no such thing as judicial and parental forgiveness. Example to destroy the parental forgiveness thing if parental forgiveness was kind of like a slap on the wrist, you know, to kind of get us back in order, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father, well, that's our Father, it would be like talking about what a parent would do, will also forgive you. That's good news. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's not a slap on the wrist. That's saying you're abiding in your sins. Your trespasses are not forgiven. This is a lying teaching, and we must understand the truth. Is there any verse that declares that our future sins are forgiven? No. There's no verse in the Bible whatsoever. Many people think that our sins are just automatically been given, forgiven in the future, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. They're failing to understand what Jesus did on the cross as opposed to what happens in our own life. Now, what do we see? When Jesus came... What was his purpose? What was his mission? John chapter, chapter 1, verse 29. It said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was going to take away the sin of the world in order to accomplish redemption. That means that he's going to bear all that sin upon him, paying the price for sin. We see another thing. 1 John chapter 2. It speaks of Jesus. Verse 2. He's the propitiation for our sins, or the means provided for, our, for us to have forgiveness of sins. Not only for our sins, but also, as it says, not only for our sins, also, but also, also for the sins of the whole world. For the whole world. Jesus bore all those sins away. Now, we also see over in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, it declares down in verse 26, and he's speaking to the Hebrews who are continually 
offering up their sacrifices continually in the Old Testament era. Now he's telling them, we don't need to do this anymore because Jesus was offered up once for sin. Then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Jesus accomplished this. He says, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. This means the fact that what they're thinking is, people, is that he put away sin. Well, if he put away sin, does that mean sin doesn't exist anymore? Well, sin still exists. Does that mean that we can't sin? No, we obviously can sin. And if we sin, we need to understand what kind of an effect that has upon us. We also see, when we think about what Jesus did, when we think about the fact that he accomplished redemption for us, that doesn't mean that all of our sins are eliminated such that we cannot sin. When it talks about taking away sin, it doesn't mean it's all gone. Obviously, there's sin that's in the world. In fact, in taking away the sins, at the same time, we see the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 9, when it says about the Holy Spirit comes to reprove the world of sin, if he took away all the sin, why is he reproving the world of sin? There must be still sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. What sin? Of sin, because they believe not on me. That shows the fact that the sins are still here, and that sin has to be dealt with in a person's life. That Jesus did not take away all sins, past, present, and future, and that they're all gone. But obviously, otherwise, the Holy Spirit would not be convicting anybody of sin if there was no reason for it. No. Now, when we have to realize what happens when a person gets born again. The Holy Spirit is convicting a person of sin, singular, not sins, but singular. One sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus. When we realize that who Jesus is, in his Romans chapter 10, Verse 9 and 10 says, If we confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So as we believe and we speak for it, it produces the salvation of the Lord. We also see over in John chapter 1, in verse 12, As many as received him, they had to take him as their Savior. To them gave he the power, the right, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when we believe on his name, and then we receive Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, we become a child of God. We become born again. Now we must realize also, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when a person receives Jesus and is born again, he doesn't need to confess all the sins that he's committed, as some people have a tendency to teach people. It's wrong. It's false. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, which means reckoning or charging, their trespasses against the, unto them. He's not in charging anybody's trespasses against them. It was only one sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus. And he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You and I are to go and preach the gospel to them. Of what? Jesus, so that they receive Jesus. Because there's only one sin. It's the sin of not believing on Jesus. It has nothing to do with confessing our own sins or repenting from our own sins. Our repentance has changed our mind, believe the gospel, receive Jesus, so we can be born again. Now, for all those who have received Jesus and they got born again, what happened to all their sins that they have committed in the past? Remember, it says he's not charging them against us. So he's not holding them against us. So because he's not holding them against us, that means they're all going to be washed away. Revelation 1.5 speaks about Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he made us kings and priests unto God. That's what happens when you and I get born again, receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Well, now that we're born again, we see that 
Our sins have been washed away that we have committed in the past up to that point in time. We also see over in Colossians 2, verse 13, you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, he's quickened us together with him. We've now make a lot, made alive, we get born again. Having forgiven you of all your trespasses or shown favor or pardon towards you, this word is a different word for normal word for forgiven. Showing pardon or forgiveness or favor towards us regarding all of our trespasses because he wasn't charging them against us and they're all washed away by the blood of Jesus. So what was washed away? It's our past sins. In Romans chapter 3, down here in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, all the past sins, through the forbearance of God. They've been dealt with. We must also understand that when we have been forgiven, we see also over in 2 Peter, that is, 2 Peter, chapter 1, over in verse 8, it speaks about if these things be in you and abound, they make you that neither you'll be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things, he's blind. He cannot see afar off. He's even forgotten that he was purged or there was a cleansing from his old sins. This literally means, because there's really no verb here, it's talking about he can't see afar off, forgetful, forgetting, or forget, having forgetfulness, essentially, of the cleansing. There's no verb here of the cleansing of his old sins. He, for, he forgets the fact that he was cleansed of his old sins. So that's all talking about sins of the past. So we know that the sins of the past are all washed away. Well, what happens when we sin? Does the sin that we have commit? Does it have any effect? Yes, it does. First John chapter 5, verse 17. It can, also, of course, can we sin? We can sin from our soul and we can sin from our flesh. In fact, we have sinful flesh. Sin dwells in the flesh. So we can sin if we yield to the flesh, or we can sin from our mind, will, or emotions, even from the soulish realm. 1 John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. So when we commit anything that's unrighteous, which would be contrary to the word of righteousness, what's that produce? That produces sin, so we miss the mark. All unrighteousness, anything contrary to God's word, produces sin in our life. Well, what's that going to do? Romans chapter 6, over in verse 16, says this, Know ye not, to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. That means you and I are yielding to a spiritual authority over us at all times. To a whom? A person. His servants you are to whom you obey. You could be yielding to God, which is what we're supposed to be yielding to, or you could be yielding to the devil. Because it says, whether of sin, who would we be yielding to if we sin? Certainly not God. We'd be yielding to unrighteousness, which would be doing what the devil would want us to do, contrary to the word. And that's going to produce death. Or we can yield to obedience to God's word that produces righteousness. So you and I, are yielding to, to some whom, and we become a servant of the one that we're yielding to. And you and I can commit sin, and what's it produce? It produces death, as we see. We also see over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. A righteous anger over things that are in injustice according to the word of God is something that we can have a righteous anger, not out of the flesh, not out of the soulish realm, but because of a righteous anger of something that's contrary to the word. But at the same time, you're not going to have it for long. You cannot let the sun go down upon your wrath. And then what happens if we do? You'll give place. It says, neither give place to the devil. You'll give place to the devil if you walk in the ways of sin. And that will allow evil spirits to come in to a person. We also see in 1 Corinthians, suppose we do something and hurt somebody, do an evil thing to a person in some way. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 8, 12. When you sow sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. When we sin against the brethren in some way, we're actually sinning against the Lord. Well, if all our sins are already washed away, why does the Bible say all these things? We can be a yielding as a servant of sin, 
It can produce death. We can be sinning and giving place to the devil, letting demons come in. We could be actually sinning against the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see all kinds of sins that the Scripture talks about and tells us to stay away from in Scripture. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, 18, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now suppose you continue in the sin of fornication. What's the Bible say about fornicators? Well, they end up in the lake of fire. They don't enter into the kingdom of God. So that has quite an effect upon it. So is that sin a future? If I commit fornication, is it washed away? No, not until I have dealt with it. These are lying teachings. What else is sin? We see in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 over in verse 23. For whatsoever is not of faith, the last part of this, is sin. That means any time we walk outside of the way of faith, which would be in the way of the Spirit after the Word of God. It produces sin in our life. God wants us to walk by faith in line with His Word at all times. We see another type of sin where we can yield to the lust of the flesh. In James chapter 1, verse 14, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And he's enticed. It says, when lust is conceived, it's taken root, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. We can yield to lusts of the flesh. And if they conceive, that is producing sin in our life. Another way we can sin. You see in James 2.9, if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. This is affecting us. So sin is an important thing. Are all these sins just passed away and we don't have to confess sin or repent or turn from them whatsoever? No. Why would the Bible be telling us all this if, in fact, all of our sins were already washed away and they were already forgiven, past, present, and future? James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That means there's sins of commission, but there's also sins of omission, which is what this is. If we don't do the things that God has told us to do and we know to do it, it still becomes an area of sin. We look over in 2 Peter. In chapter 2, verse 14, it speaks of the one having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. The adulterers, they don't enter in. They end up in the lake of fire as well. They end up in not entering into the kingdom of God. All these areas of sin. And what's sin going to do? To sin, if all of our sins are washed away, that means there should be no penalty for sin. Well, suppose we do continue to walk in sin. John chapter 5 Verse 14, at the guy who got healed in the pool of Bethesda, Jesus found him in the temple afterwards. He said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto you. There is a penalty for sin, and we will be affected by sin in our life. In fact, you can even be a servant of sin, even as someone who's born again, even though you're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be a servant of righteousness. He talks about, in John chapter 8, Verse 34, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And whatever you're yielding to is what you become a servant of. We're not going to commit sin and be a servant of sin, but that's what we are if we do that. We also see that sin is very deceitful, and it will deceive you and cause a hardening in your heart if you allow it to go on. That means we have to watch about not yielding to sin. Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If all of our sins are washed away, we shouldn't have any problems with this at all, but we can be deceived by sin, and the result is it will harden us in our life. We certainly haven't seen any major maybe things. It's bad, but or is real judgment's going to come upon us? You better believe it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Remember, he's talking to the Hebrews where they were used to offering up their sacrifices for sin every time they committed it. Well, he's saying now it's a different day because God does not wink at sin anymore. He commands every man to repent. And he says in Hebrews 10, 26, he says, If we willfully sin, sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, 
There remains no more sacrifice for sins to get out of this thing. No. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. In other words, judgment is going to come upon us when we walk in the ways of sin. Obviously, that means that our sins are not forgiven and washed away, or there's no penalty for our sins. It's a lying teaching. Sin will bring judgment upon us. It's going to affect a believer in his relationship with the Lord. It's going to produce unrighteousness and bring all kinds of judgments upon them. It's going to affect everybody in the world. It affects non-believers, whether they understand it or not. Sin still open up the door for evil spirits and curses coming upon them. It affects everybody. And judgments will come. We know that from whenever we commit sins, it's going to have not only an effect upon our own life, but there'll be inherited generational iniquity effect as well. Lamentations 5-7 uh, says, Lamentations 5-7, Our fathers have sinned and are not, meaning they've passed on. And we have borne their iniquities. That is an inherited generational iniquity curse coming down the line because of our father's sins. See, a lot of these people say there's no inherited curses because all our sins are forgiven, so there can't be any curses coming. Christ redeemed us from all this, so we don't have any curses coming upon us. That's a lie. When we sin, we are going to bear the iniquities of our forefathers. Numbers, chapter 14, and verse 18, says, The Lord's long suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. They don't get off. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation. That means you and I are all affected by the sins of our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. These iniquity, heritage generational iniquity curses. Do we see that happening? Cancer coming down the line, diabetes coming down the line, heart problems coming down the line, you know, anger problems coming down the line, poverty down the line, whatever it might be, all kinds of things. Addictive compulsive problems, of course we do. Not just the world, but Christians as well. So, if all the Christians, all their future sins and all these, everything past, present, future was wiped away, how could we be having these problems? See, it's all lies, lying teachings that the devil has brought forth. Doctrines of devils in these last days. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 20 even tells us something. It says, if a man lie with his uncle's wife, he's covered his uncle's nakedness, they shall bear their sin and they shall die childless. That's because of sin that would come here with, from an adulterous, ancestral type of a, a union here, getting involved in this. It says they're going to die childless. That is a barrenness curse. Have we seen Christians have barrenness problems? We sure have. That shows you that these things are coming upon people. There is a cause for things. We see over in Psalms 38, the effects of what sin will do. Verse 3, it says, There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. No rest in my bones because of my sin? That sounds like arthritis or some kind of problem, pains or something going on in my bones. That's because of sin. Do we see Christians as well as people out there, Christians having arthritic problems or pain and problems in their bones? We sure do. No, their sins must not be washed away. There must be some effects going on. Psalms 41. How about those that have been wounded and hurt, and damaged, bruised, emotionally, mentally? Psalms 41.4. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Some people have brought it on themselves. Some people have been victimized. Sin, whether it's you doing it or whether you were victimized by someone else committing sin against you, will bring damage to your soul. Our soul needs to be healed. That shows us that we are affected by sins that we committed as well as sins that other people have committed against us, bringing damage against our soul. We see over in Isaiah, chapter 38, Isaiah chapter 38, pick up over in verse 17. He says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. What caused his problem? 
sin of bitterness. And what happened? He didn't have peace. He had great bitterness. He lost his peace until God ministered to him and delivered him from that by dealing with the sin. But sin caused him to not have peace because of bitterness. Do Christians have that problem today? You better believe it. Jeremiah chapter 5. Have there been Christians that haven't seen good things happen to them in their lives because of walking in ways of sin? Jeremiah 5.25, your iniquities have turned away these things. Your sins have withholden good things from you. There have been lots of people that haven't walked the way they should. And they've seen the effects of sin withhold good things from them. Of course, you have a lot of this from inherited generational. You have a lot of it from different things that have occurred in your life. Praise God for deliverance. We can cast out all the spirits and get set free from all these spirits that are trying to hinder us. So, we look at anybody, regardless, whether it's unbelievers or whether it's believers. Do they have inherited generational curses from sin? Yes. Are there barrenness problems, arthritic problems, soul, soul realm problems, needs healed, bitterness, no, no, no peace, good things from hell within them, all these kind of problems? Of course there are. So, sin is affecting everybody, including Christians, and they're not forgiven of all of our present or future sins unless we have dealt with them and confessed them before the Lord. So what are we supposed to do? Jesus took away all the sin of the world, which means that he now has made provision that we now could, we don't have to be in bondage to sin any longer. He paid the price for it to accomplish redemption. And now the blood of Jesus Christ is ready to be applied to our life to cleanse us from sin. In the Old Testament, they didn't, didn't have that. It was only a covering over for sin. Now in the New Testament, because of what Jesus did, we can be cleansed of our sin. But does that mean that because we're born again or because we're a believer, that all of our sins are already forgiven, present and future? No. That is the line teaching. Come back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins... That's our job. You and I have the responsibility to confess our sins. So, that means it's all dependent upon us. Many people think that it's all God. Well, everything God's going to do all this stuff. No, this happens to be a subjunctive mood verb, which literally would mean if we may confess our sins, it all depends on whether we do it. Present tense, subjunctive mood verb, you would translate as Young's translate it. If we may confess our sins, that means it depends upon whether we do it. So is God automatically forgiving us and cleansing us? No, it's all depending upon what, what you and I do. If we may confess our sins, He is faithful and just. We talk about this word is. Does this mean He's already done it and it's already done and already finished? No. Present tense means He is on an ongoing availability or ongoing effect, ongoing action, he is continually faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That means he's always ready to do that if we meet the conditions. That means obviously our sins aren't washed, our, our, all the past, our future sins aren't washed away or what, there'd be no reason for that. And when he says just to forgive us our sins, again, this is not automatic. This is all dependent upon the conditions being met. We know this because it is a subjunctive mood verb which expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. So it's why you would translate it just that he might. See, this is not, it looks like to forgive is an infinitive. It's not an infinitive. It's a not a good way to translate it at all. Instead, this is actually a a, has a tense voice and mood, a regular verb. It would essentially say that he is faithful and just, that he may, might, or more better, he might forgive us our sins, because it's an aorist tense, that he might forgive us our sins. By the way, the word up here, when you put the cursor over the word to, makes you think it's an infinitive, to forgive. Why they translate it to when it means that? It's the Hena clause in the Greek, which means that or in order that. That's what it means. It should never translate it that way. That's why Young's translates it correctly, that. 
if, if, we may, if we may confess our sins, he is continually faithful and just, that he might forgive us our sins if we met those conditions. And, same thing here, cleanse is also subjunctive mood, that he might cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Otherwise, it's all conditional upon what? You and me. Me, you and me meeting the conditions of confessing our sins. And obviously we have to turn away from them as well. We can't continue in them or we're not going to get forgiven, which certainly we're going to have to repent and turn from areas of sin in our life. We also see, as we read on here, it says in verse 10, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Well, that shows us we're all sinning, but it doesn't mean that just because when I sin, they're automatically uh, cleansed and forgiven by the Lord. No. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we talked about this in the present ministry of Jesus. An advocate is like one who pleads our case before us. It's like a heavenly attorney who's going to represent us. If any man sin, we have our attorney with the Father, who is Jesus Christ the righteous. And what's he going to do? He is then going to, when we confess our sins, he, his blood is going to be applied cleansing us from all that sin at that very moment in time. Of course, he says, I'm writing these things, so you say, don't sin. God does not want us to sin. But if we do sin, if any man sin, that shows us the fact that we can sin. If any man sin, subjunctive mood, or any man might sin, that means we can sin or we don't have to sin. Because remember, sin has no dominion over us anymore. But that obviously means that our sins are not forgiven of us whatsoever. We can sin. We might sin. If so, we need somebody to represent us, and that's Jesus. Jesus is representing us as a heavenly attorney, and so when we have met the conditions, he's going to apply the blood, and we're going to be cleansed. If we go back to 1-7 of 1 John, we even see that Jesus carries on a continual ministry of applying the blood for whoever has met the conditions, and we see that the blood is applied when we've confessed our sins, but also when we walk in the light as he's in the light, which would be in line with the word of righteousness. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. It keeps us cleansed. It has an ongoing effect. But again, is this automatic? No. There's a condition for this, isn't it? What's the condition? That you and I are to walk in the light, and it's a subjunctive mood. So again, it would essentially say, because it's present tense subjunctive, if we may continually walk in the light, that's the condition, as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. So it's not automatically doing it. If it were all of our sins were already forgiven, present and future, it would not say that. It would just say, hey, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin whenever you commit it, period. And that's it. It'd be a flat statement. But it's not. No. It's all conditional upon you and I meeting the conditions. If we walk in the light, that is the, what it'll do. And he will continually keep us cleansed from all sin. So it'll be continually applied. So that obviously means you and I have to deal with sin. And God does not want us to walk in sin. In fact, we even see over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. God does not want us to let sin have dominion in our life or to affect us in our life because it's going to bring destructive effects. It gives place to the enemy. It brings judgments upon us. In fact, he comes down in verse 4 and he says, you have not yet resisted on the blood, striving or strive, struggling and fighting against sin. If all of our sins are washed away, why waste my time str struggling and fighting against sin if they're, I'm already forgiven? You know, it's all taken care of. I don't need to do anything. No, it's not taken care of. It's a lying teaching. We are to strive and fight and struggle against sin so we don't give place to the devil. In fact, God wants us to resist continually, even to the point of like drops of blood you know, with such intensity of, of resisting so we don't yield to any kind of areas of sin. Remember that all unrighteousness is sin. So you know, we want to be sure we're righteous. Who's the ones who are going to enter into eternal life? It's the righteous, isn't it? But what determines whether or not we're righteous or not? 
Well, people say, well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 declares that we're made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? Yeah, it looks like it's already been a done deal, doesn't it? He is the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, mankind. Who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, that we, talking about mankind, who would receive Jesus, might be made the righteousness of God. Sound like it's a done deal, but it's not. The word made, first one up here, means made. The second word made is not the same word in the Greek. It is the word genomai. Notice it in the lower window. And it means to become. There's a big difference between made and become. If made, it's a done deal. See, that was the first word back here. It means made, maker made. But this is a different word. They translated it in error. It means become. And it's also interesting that this happens to be a subjunctive mood verb as well, which means it's conditional. It doesn't mean it's already happened. The subjunctive mood means that which is conditional upon conditions being met, it's indicating something that's not a fact, but it has to be con met, conditions met. And it's also present tense, which means the meeting of this conditions is going to be an ongoing action in your life to see whether or not you meet the conditions. So the way you would translate this is so that we may become, as Young brings it out, if we, the righteousness of God, if we meet the conditions of continually walking in his ways of righteousness. Otherwise, it's not a done deal. Righteousness is all dependent upon you and I doing the word of righteousness, having been born again. Now, you're, not, you're never righteous if you just try to be righteous in your own works. You have to get born again and get a brand new spirit that's right with God first. If you don't have a spirit that's right with God, you'll never be righteous. That's why you have to be born again. But righteousness is more than just having a new spirit that's right with God. It also comes down to what you're doing. Because 1 John 3, 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. Whenever we see this in Scripture, we must know it's warning us not to be deceived. Why would God warn somebody in Scripture about not being deceived because the subject that's about to be discussed, obviously he knows in his foreknowledge that false teaching is going forth on it and he wants to be sure we're not deceived about this point. So let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. The word doeth is in the present tense, which means he who is continually doing righteousness. How do we continually do righteousness? We do the word of righteousness. If we do the word of righteousness, we're going to be righteous. If we don't do the word of righteousness, we're doing unrighteousness, and that produces sin, and we're not going to be righteous. So it's not just the fact that we're born again. It's what we do. You say, well, that sounds like works. It's not me doing my own works. It's me doing his works of doing his word. When I do his word, then he's the one who accomplishes that in me. So it's never us doing our own thing. It's doing his thing. We're doing his word. It's important to understand that. So the one who is continually doing righteousness will be righteous even as he is righteous. See, the false, false teaching is the fact that forgiveness is unconditional. It's a lie. Forgiveness is conditional. So, the lying teaching has gone forth, unfortunately. And some of the scriptures that they will use, the people will use to try to say that, well, the scriptures show the fact that, you know, we're, everything's already taken care of. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. It says, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What's that mean? That doesn't mean that sin was taken care of as far as forgiven of us all forever. It just means the fact that he offered the sacrifice. There isn't a need for another sacrifice. It's already been done. It's already been accomplished. So that we can be forgiven of our sins, the sacrifice was accomplished. Not that we already are forgiven of our sins, but it's so that we can be forgiven of our sins. We don't need to offer any more sacrifices. 
It's been done once and for all by Jesus. The blood of Jesus now is available to wash our sins away. Praise God. In verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is one that people bring up. Jesus was the offering. Look what it says. He has perfected. And when it talks about perfected, that means come to perfection, complete. And this happens to be a perfect tense verb. That means, in the perfect tense, in the Greek means, completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. So it sounds like Jesus' offering has made me perfect in the past with results happening now. It's already done forever. Well, there's a problem here. It goes on and says, them that are sanctified. And it's assumed that, well, that means we're already sanctified. Well, let's look at this. You put the cursor over the word sanctified. It happens to be a present tense verb. So who's this talking to? It says he has by one offering perfected forever who? Those who are being sanctified because it's a present tense verb. It's not a past tense. Who are being sanctified. That's the way you would translate a present tense verb. Otherwise, it's available, it's been accomplished for all of us and if we are on the road of being sanctified, then everything that Jesus has done for us will be applied to us. If we're not walking that road, then it would not be applied to us. The condition is you and I are to being, be being sanctified continually. That's the condition. We see down here in verse 17. He says, their sins and iniquities, or lawlessness this mean, will I remember no more. Now, when it talks about here, is that a flat statement that's a fact that Jesus made? Is that a flat statement just he made automatically? No. It's, again, a subjunctive mood verb, which means it's conditional. Remember, subjunctive mood reflects things, speaks of things that are not facts, that are conditional upon conditions being met. So, even Jung's didn't pick up on that. He's got a, I will remember, but that's not a good translation. Their sins and their lawlessness, I might no more remember if the conditions are met. Otherwise, you've got to confess your sins. You're going to have to repent of your sins. You're going to have to deal with your sins if you're going to see them that uh, be accomplished. But people haven't studied, and so they just assume that's a flat statement. See, he doesn't remember sins anymore. That means they're all forgiven forever, everything. Not so. Only if we meet the conditions. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. That's right. No more offering for sin because we don't need to have an offering for sin any longer because Jesus was the offering for sin. Now the blood's up there all the time, available, ready to deal with our sins. All we got to do is go and confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The fact that there's no more offering for sin doesn't mean that all of our sins are automatically washed away. The blood, remember, we already saw, is only applied when you meet the conditions of either confessing your sins and or walking in the light as he is in the light. Remember 1 John 1, 7 and 1 John 1, 9. Again, this shows the fact here, because of his offering for sin, sin's been dealt with in general in the sense that all sins are always have been dealt with. The fact that Jesus paid the price for them, now the blood's up there, ready to be applied to every individual who would need to confess their sins if they have sinned. Praise God. Remember, when we commit unrighteous, when we commit unrighteousness, it produces sin, and of course we need to then, of course, confess it. Hebrews chapter 2, over here in verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one. Well, it sounds like, okay, he's the one that sanctified, all is sanctified. It sounds like it's already been done. No? Again, we've got to look at these words. This first one, present tense. He that is sanctifying 
Who's that? The Lord, who's accomplishing the sanctification process in our life. And they who are sanctified, who would that be? That would be all of us, right? Well, let's take a look at what that verb is. It sounds like it's a past tense one, are sanctified, doesn't it? Is it a past tense verb? No. It's a present tense verb. So how would you translate that? Both he that is sanctifying, as Young brings out, and they who are being sanctified, present tense ongoing action, otherwise he's doing the work and we're getting the work done in us, it's working combined, all, all in one. So we're working out our salvation, you know. He's doing the work in us, and we're continually being sanctified, or all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Another scripture that people bring up. Without looking at the tense voice and mood and looking up things, they can easily get off. Remember this, Colossians 2, 13, 14. You be dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, uh, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, what is he talking about? Is he talking about all sins? No. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. This is talking about things in the past. Everything, anything, past things. Not talking about something that's present or future. The things that were against us. So this is referring to all the sins that Jesus was taking upon himself. This happens to be an imperfect tense uh, verb here. And so it's showing something that was ongoing in the past. All these sins that were against us. So what did Jesus do? He sacrificed, his sacrifice forgave sins generally, so there's no further sacrifice necessary for sin. We're not forgiven of future sins until we confess them, but do we need to sacrifice again? No, there's no need for sacrificing again whatsoever. What does that mean? You and I need to confess our sins to see the blood of Jesus applied for present and future sins. Also, we must be sure that we're walking in righteousness as well. If we don't walk in the way of righteousness, are our sins going to be forgiven and cleansed? No way. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. We go back to verse uh, uh, 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Can we yield our members as unri members of unrighteousness? Sure we can. We listen to the wrong thing, see the wrong thing. Uh, speak the wrong thing, think the wrong thing, so one of our members. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. Sin shall not have dominion over you. God does not want to sin have dominion. It shall not have dominion over you. You're not to let it operate in your life. In fact, we even go back, and he tells in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it, in the lust thereof, how does sin work if you obey it? We don't have to obey it. You'd have to obey it to let it work, though, go on, yielding to it in some manner. In here, it talks about the lusts of the flesh and the mortal body. Then he comes down there and he says, verse 16, Know ye not to whom, we saw this, to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. That's what we were. You obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was delivered you. We received the gospel. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We are free from sin. We are now servants of righteousness. But does that mean we can't sin? No. So does that mean all my sins are washed away? No. When I sin, I'm going to have to confess them and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. He goes on and says, For... I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or weakness of your flesh. For as you've yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to lawlessness, producing more lawlessness, it means literally, and if you continue to do it, it'll keep producing that, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. And of course, if we, we didn't mention in verse 16, what do we do? In order to see righteousness, we are obedient obedience to the word. Now some people say, well, this sounds like it's works, all work stuff. It's not our works, it's his works. How are they put in operation? By our obedience. 
Otherwise, he needs our cooperation. God does not automatically make us do things that produces his results in us. You and I have to choose to obey his word. Obedience produces righteousness. And then, righteousness produces holiness. And that's what we need. We need holiness in our life. He goes on and says, you were the servants of sin, now you're free, you are free from righteousness. What fruit had you in those things wherever you're now ashamed? The end of those things is death. We had a lot of bad fruit. Being now made free from sin, become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness. And what's the end res result of that? And the end result is everlasting life. We need holiness. We need to be holy before the Lord. In fact, if we aren't walking holy before the Lord, we're, gonna, we're not going to see... We're not going to see victory come forth. We're not going to see the Lord, as it talks about. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God wants us to be holy. And how are we going to be holy? Because we're going to conquer sin in our life. You see, if we don't need to confess our sins anymore, then that means that we'll just do whatever we want to do. If we think they're already forgiven. Or if we think it's a paternal forgiveness and he's just going to be a nice little slap on the hand to get us back in order and has no real effect upon us for uh, uh, internally affecting us like, we, you know, eternal effect of unrighteousness upon us. Well, that's not, that's contrary to the word, isn't it? It's not so. We can be yielding to all kinds of things that will affect us if we walk in the ways of sin. Look what it says in 1 Peter 1, 15. You see, God wants us, expects us to be holy. Now, as he which hath called you is holy, so become, get am I, in the lower window, become, and this is a command. This is not a suggestion. God is commanding you and me. It's not like, try your best. No, I command you to become holy in all manner of life, conduct, and behavior. Oh, that means I can't just do anything I want to do. My sins obviously aren't forgiven and cleansed. If I'm, if I'm commanded to be holy, I've got to be doing something that's going to be producing holiness in my life. Because it's written, become holy, for I am holy. That's why it says, if you call on the Father without respect to person, judges according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear. We need to have the fear of God before us. This is also why we got to deal with everything in our life because God wants us to perfect holiness in our life. Well, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says this. Having therefore these promises, we got all these promises, great promises of the Word of God. Dearly beloved, let us, uh, that's putting the responsibility on you and me, isn't it now? Well, I thought it was God who's going to do everything. Well, God's going to do things when you do what He says so He can accomplish it. But you and I have a part to play in it. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We've got to get rid of all the filthiness. That means we've got to deal with all the fleshly works, all those sinful things. Get rid of them. And the filthiness of the spirit, which is what? All the evil spirits that are in us. Remember, our spirit is not evil, have any evil in it or filthiness. The filthiness of the spirit are all the evil spirits of us. That's why we cast out the demons and we get rid of all the works of the flesh. And what's going to be the result? We perfect holiness in the fear of God. This is our responsibility to do it. You and I are to do this. Remember, when it says, let us cleanse ourselves, that means it's our responsibility and it's a subjunctive mood verb for cleanse, which means it's all conditional upon you and I doing what he says. Therefore, you'll never perfect holiness in your life if you don't deal with the filthiness of the flesh and get cleansed out and casting out these spirits in order to drive them out. That's why we do these things. That's our motivation for deliverance should be not just to get free of a problem and get healed or get my pain off. No, I want to get rid of everything out of my life so that I can perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. God wants us to be holy before him. We see over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 12, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Unblameable in holiness. 
That means we're going to be holy and we're going to be blameless. Because remember, Jesus is going to present a church to him that's glorious, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, that's holy, unrebukable, unreprovable in his sight. That's what he's going to accomplish in us as we do the word and conquer sin, strive against it, fight against it in our life. Also, second, uh, he, uh, Hebrews 12, 10, speaks about how the Father, it's speaking about an earthly father compared to the heavenly father. They, speaking about an earthly father, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, talking about the Father, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. We gotta be corrected. If we won't be correctable and receive correction, we'll never come to the place of holiness because every one of us needs to be corrected to brought, be brought in line with the word of God. And if we don't get come to the place of holiness, look what it says in verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That means we gotta deal with sin. So how can this attitude, all my sins are already forgiven, doesn't matter what I do. You know, everything's okay. That's never going to produce holiness in your life. No, it's a lying teaching, and it's, these people are all going to be in great trouble. You say, well, what about your works? If my sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus when I confess them, does that mean all the works are gone too? No, your works are not gone. Your works are already written in the books, as the Bible says in Revelation, and they aren't being wiped away. That's not good news, but it's reality. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We're all gonna give account. What are we gonna give account of? All of our works. Remember what it talks about over Colossians chapter three? It speaks about how whatever we do, we do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. Our works, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance because you serve the Lord Christ when you're doing things unto the Lord. But what's the next verse say? But he that doth wrong, he's going to receive for the wrong that he has done. That means your works are going to follow you and you're going to have an effect from your works. And there's no respect of persons. Say, so, well, that's just uh, maybe for a few things. Uh, I can't be all my works. Yes, it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. We do things in our body, don't we? According that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That means, you say, well, if I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus, what has that done for me? It's got me right fellowship with the Lord, so I'm right with Him. It didn't get rid of my works. It certainly got me in the place, so now I, I'm going to walk in the way of the Lord, so I don't continue in doing wrong works. And if I put the Word of God first place and truly have repentance and walk in Him, I'm going to start doing all these good works, so I'll get a lot of rewards, which is, of course, what we want to see. But if I continue to do bad works, they aren't going to be eliminated. Because when the books are open, all the works are going to be taken a look at. We even see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, over in verse 13. Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. They're all going to be tried. He says, if any man's work abide, I mean, it passed the test. Yeah, it was something of the Lord, serving the Lord, which he has built thereupon. That means you're building something in your life through your works. He shall receive a reward. That's good news. If any man's work shall be burned, it wasn't of the Lord. It got burned up. He shall suffer loss. That doesn't mean you're not going to be saved. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You're going to be saved because of the fact that you're right with the Lord, having confessed your sins, received forgiveness and cleansing in the blood of Jesus applied, so you're right with Him. And you're doing what He says, you're doing in the ways of righteousness. So as you're walking in righteous, doing righteous, you'll be righteous, so you're going to have a lot of good works. 
But don't think at the same time that all your past works are all eliminated. They're not. They are going to be, the books will be open, and don't be down about that. It's just reality. Well, it should motivate you, if anything. Hey, I'm going to make sure all my works are good from now on. I want to get a whole lot of good works here, good things, serving the Lord, and kind of counter off, balance off this other stuff that I got over here that wasn't so good. So this today is the first day of the rest of our life. What are we going to do? We're going to make our decision. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to do what's right in His sight. We're going to speak His word. We're going to think on good things. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do everything unto the Lord. We're going to strive against sin. We're going to be sure we confess our sins, walk in the way of the Lord, carry out the things that God wants us to do, be a doer of the word, doer of righteousness, so we can see that all our works will be rewarded. They'll stand, and we'll see rewards come in the life to come. Praise God. So, we've seen some important things tonight. We've seen the fact that we've got a lying teaching out there in the body of Christ, and it says that all of our sins past, present, and future are already forgiven for us individually. Not so. Jesus paid the price for sin to accomplish redemption so that there's no more need for sacrifice for sins. Now the blood of Jesus Christ is up there in heaven which is ready to be applied to every individual when they meet the conditions of confessing the sin and or walking in the light as he is in the light, and Jesus is the one who's applying it when we meet the conditions. Our past, our past sins are forgiven when we are born again because he's not holding those or charging those against us. Only one sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus. Since they're not charged against us, they'd be washed away. That They're not against us. Now we have the effects of them, remember, from the evil spirits that have come in from inheritance, our own sins of victimization, but as far as our relationship with God, it has no effect upon our relationship because they're washed away. We have the effects of those sins from evil spirits that came in, and of course we can cast them out and get free of that and get healed. So now, as a believer, we need to confess our sins, receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness, walk in the ways of the Lord to see the blood of Jesus Christ. So believers are going to confess their sins, as it says in 1 John 1, 9, which is written to believers. So, now we want to be sure that we confess our sins. We want to be sure that we strive against sin. If there's a sin that so easily besets you, you want to get this thing out of your life. And you don't want to be yielding to ways of sin by yielding any of your members to sin any longer because it's going to be giving place to the devil not only to affect you in your life now, but any works that we're doing that are contrary to the word, that they're piling, piling them up on the negative side. We don't want negative works accumulating in our life. We want righteous works accumulated. We want, when all of our works are tried, praise God, look at all those ones that are abiding, and we're going to get rewarded for it. Therefore, we've got to watch what we're doing. This teaching that says that it doesn't matter what we do, we can do anything we want. I don't need to confess my sins. I don't need to repent. That's ridiculous. Totally contrary to the Word. In fact, the Bible even makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 7 down here in verse 10, where it says, Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. God expects everybody to repent. Repent. It works repentance, true repentance, and we're all supposed to repent. Remember it talks about over in Romans 2.4 how the goodness of God is going to lead us to repentance. He wants us to repent. The goodness of God leads to us to repent, change our mind. We can't be walking the ways of sin. We can't be speaking wrong things. We can't be letting the devil have place in our mind. We can't be doing things contrary to the Word of God. It's going to have a toll. All these people that are believing this, they're in trouble. They're not going to confess their sins. They're not having repentance in their life. They're not cleansing themselves from all the filthiness of the flesh. And they certainly aren't casting the demons out of themselves, that's for sure. They think everything's all done. That's why they think they don't have any problems, you know, that everything must be God. I wonder why they have all these problems in their life. Well, just what happens, you know, must be God. God always gets the blame. He must be allowing all these things. God has nothing to do with allowing all these negative things. It's the devils that are coming in because of the open door of sin and all these things that have caused their problems. 
It's deceived the multitudes. The truth is, you get born again. Remember, there's only one sin, which is the sin of not believing in Jesus that we're convicted of. That's why you preach Christ to people, not you dirty old sinner, you've got to repent of your sins. No, you preach Christ to them to receive Jesus. In fact, give them the good news. God's not holding your sins against you. What? Most people never hear that. He's what? He's not holding my sins against me? That's right. He's only holding one sin against you. It's not believing on Jesus. That's why you come just as you are and you receive Jesus and you get born again. Then after that, now we confess all of our, confess our sins that we commit and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness and then walk in the ways of the Lord. Same time, remember though, you still have the effects of them. We still got to cast out the demons that come in from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization. All those things are still there, but we can get free. And as we walk in the ways of the Lord, of course, remember, your works, they didn't get washed away. Your works are there. So we want to be sure that we are doing the things that God wants. Because when he comes, his reward is coming according to our works. Praise God. We're going to make our decision. We're going to walk in line with the word. We're going to do what's right. We're going to confess our sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. We're going to walk in the light so the blood of Jesus Christ is continually applied, keeping us in fellowship with the Lord. And we're going to cleanse ourselves of all the filthiness of flesh and cast out all these demons and walk in the way of the Lord and do what he says and serve the Lord, do everything unto him and start piling up the rewards in our life and doing all the things that God wants us to do. That's what God wants for every single one of us. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the truth. I thank you that I see that my sins were not charged against me prior to being born again. There was only one sin, the sin of not believing on Jesus. I received Jesus. My past sins were washed away. Not my works, not the effects of what my sins were, but my sins in relationship to God were washed away. Now as a believer, I am to confess my sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. It is conditional upon me meeting the conditions. I will confess my sins. I will receive forgiveness. I will repent and turn away from all that is not of you. And I will strive against sin. I will resist sin. I will get rid of every sin in my life. And I'm going to walk in your ways and do what is right in your sight so that I'm doing everything unto you. As I'm doing righteousness, my works will abide and I will be rewarded. Thank you, Lord. I'm making my decision. I'm walking the way of the Lord. I'm going to be a doer of your word. So I pile up rewards and I will stay righteous with you, in fellowship with you. No sin is going to work in my life. If I sin, I got a heavenly attorney, and I'm going to confess that sin immediately and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus will be applied, and all my sins will be washed away. I'm going to walk in the light. So the blood's continually applied. And I will stay in fellowship with the Lord. And I thank you that I will do what's right and see rewards come forth in my life as my works will abide. Thank you, Lord, for the truth. So I don't believe any lies that present and future sins are automatically already forgiven. No, it's when I confess my sins and walk in the light that the blood is applied and I will stay right with the Lord all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Certainly an important message, not only just for the message of what it says, but also for people out there in the body of Christ. You come across these people that say that, give them the scriptures, teach them the truth so that they can come to the place of repentance and not believe the lie and think that they can just do whatever they want. These people are in very serious trouble with the Lord 
and they're going to they're going to have lots of bad works and report that's going to come when they have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ if they even get there if they walk the walk of the Lord praise God father we thank you and praise you for all that you're going to bring forth in our life as we're doers of your word thank you for the truth and father thank you for opening the eyes of all those people that have believed these lies of past present and future sins already having been forgiven automatically father thank you for showing them that it was what Jesus accomplished provided that no more sacrifice was necessary and now the blood is on the mercy seat ready to be applied to every one of us when we meet the conditions father thank you for bringing the truth to the body of Christ bringing them out of this lying doctrine of the devil so that they will confess their sins and walk in the light so the blood is applied so they will be right with you father we thank you that we will be doers of your word and we will see much fruit come forth as we do it in Jesus name Amen.